All right, thank you, Sarah. Thank you to the team at ARM for putting together another fantastic meeting. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to give you a brief introduction to Audentes Therapeutics uh, in the time we have together. As a publicly traded company, and I'll be making forward-looking statements, I need to refer you to the safe harbor statement. Audentes Therapeutics is a company focused on the development of AAV gene therapy products for patients with serious and life-threatening rare diseases. We're a clinical stage company now, which I'm happy to tell you about some more today. Uh, we've built a multi-product pipeline over time using very strict criteria. Uh, what does that mean? It, it means that we've chosen targets that we think are a great fit scientifically, uh, medically, and that we can, where we can apply the science in a thoughtful manner to, frankly, increase the chances of success. Uh, in each of these indications and to demonstrate extremely powerful clinical benefit for patients. Um, all of our programs are, are targeting indications with limited or no treatment options. Uh, we've invested in internal GMP manufacturing, which uh, I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment, but we believe is a key strategic advantage for our business. Uh, we've built a wonderful team, uh, upwards of 145 employees. Now we're based in San Francisco and South San Francisco. And finally, most exciting uh, is that we'll have preliminary data from our LEAD2 programs uh, by the end of this year. On the pipeline, uh, four programs I mentioned, uh, two neck and neck here. X-linked myotubular myopathy is a neuromuscular disease I'll tell you more about in a moment. Kriegler-Najjar syndrome, severe liver disease. Pompeii and CPVT won't have time to tell you about today. Pompeii, another neuromuscular disease. And uh, CPVT stands for catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. It's a mouthful, but it's in a form of inherited arrhythmia, and we believe uh, the heart is an interesting target for AAV science. <clears throat> so on the manufacturing front, many of you, of course, are familiar with the complexities of manufacturing in this field, and in our case, it's about AAV specifically. Uh, we've chosen to invest internally in a large-scale manufacturing operation, which was a courageous decision when we were two years from the clinic, but one that we believe gives us major strategic advantage in the obvious ways initially, which are better control over our timelines, our costs, and, and importantly, the intellectual property or at least trade secrets and know-how associated with learning how to do this at large scale because it's so new to all of us and the whole field is in its nascency as far as our uh, state of expertise, if you will. And so there's a lot to learn and owning that we believe is extremely valuable. It also is a strategic advantage for us as our vision as a company is to continue to add programs to our pipeline, whether through organic development or uh, through partnerships. And having manufacturing and the ability to move quickly really uh, adds power to that story. We believe in mammalian cells as the host for manufacturing AAV. We've developed a large-scale uh, serum-free suspension culture system, 500-liter five, scale, two 500-liter reactors currently working in about 17,000 square feet GMP facility with plenty of room for expansion to add another 5,000 liters or so of capacity, which we'll do at the right time here based on upcoming clinical results, I'm sure. Uh, In-house QC uh, analytical method testing and development is a critical aspect of it. Sue just mentioned it. I'll reiterate it. Owning it uh, in our own uh, house is, uh, we believe, going to be extremely valuable as we progress on the regulatory front. So. And finally, I'll just mention that our facility is designed to be commercial, U.S., Europe, and global. Um, and so as a result, with the process already at a large scale of a high quality system and with the right attention to the facility's details, we believe we'll be able to move seamlessly from hopefully promising clinical data to uh, license applications and global approval. So let me tell you about X-linked MTM. It's a, it's a terrible disease, uh, quite simply. It's a severe neuromuscular disease in boys. Uh, they're born terribly impaired, very weak, unable to do much for themselves, including breathe. You can see a picture of a young boy uh, with obviously invas invasive ventilatory support early in life. It's a rare disease, one in 50,000 uh, newborn males. The disease is well understood. We're missing a protein in these patients called myotubularin, which, which is encoded by the MTM1 gene. And uh, we're going to obviously try to replace that gene using, in this case, an AAV8 vector with muscle-specific promoter uh, to focus expression where we want it. It's an interesting disease. It, it also is uh, a couple hallmarks that we believe increase the chances of success, which we are things we think about when we build our pipeline. Is it's a, it's a muscle disease where the muscle tissue is reasonably healthy. It's not a muscular dystrophy. It's a congenital myopathy. So it doesn't have the same degree of inflammation, stress, and scarring. Uh, and irreversible damage you can see in, in things like Duchenne. 
Uh, in addition, it's an enzyme, and all the data tell us that you don't need very much of it to produce a therapeutic response. So we think those things will help our chances of producing a powerful benefit in these boys. Now we have a whole uh, body of preclinical data, and last year uh, was highly amusing because we have dog video. We have a naturally occurring dog model of the disease, and the results have been stunning over time. Full survival benefit, uh, uh, look like normal dogs now five years after infusion in a model where they normally die at 20 weeks of age. We infuse them one time at eight, nine weeks of age, and they're alive and well today, despite significant years and growth. Uh, last year I showed the video and it was comical because it froze in front of uh, everyone and I started sweating profusely, of course, and, uh, and did my best tap dance. We're not going to do the videos this year. Hopefully that's not disappointing. I'm going to tell you about our clinical program, which uh, frankly was designed to be uh, as robust a program as possible for an early stage uh, program, but one that's targeting a disease where if, the data can, if we can show the data, we should try to get this approved as quickly as possible. And so we took a thoughtful approach starting with a medical record review study called Brasensis. We reviewed the records of 117 boys living and deceased with MTM and learned what we could. Uh, medical records are spotty in what they offer in information usually, um, but we learned a lot and it helped us characterize the disease burden in particular. We moved on to Inceptus. About a year ago we started this, a natural history, and we call it a run-in study, as a lead-in to our eventual phase 1-2 Aspiro. Inceptus, a prospective study with two primary objectives. Establish a longitudinal baseline in these boys using the same tests that we envisioned using in Aspiro so that we would have the opportunity to see what their baseline condition was over time and have a good way to compare their results post-treatment and then also facilitate the operations of, of Aspiro. So we're doing it at all the same centers, US and Europe, all the same team members obviously are involved. These are complex boys to work with, so the lessons learned in Inceptus are quite valuable operationally, and maybe most importantly, it's the same boys. So we're hoping to uh, enroll Aspiro based on patients who've been in Inceptus, obviously. So it sort of pre-enrolls the phase one, two. Aspiro, uh, the drug trial, uh, very happy to report that we treated our first boy two weeks ago. So without question, the most exciting milestone in the history of the company. And uh, now, of course, we desperately hope that he does well and that the patients that follow do so as well. Uh, I'll tell you more about that study now. Um, and as I mentioned, preliminary data. Also, orphan drug in U.S. and Europe, and we recently announced uh, rare pediatric disease and fast-track designation from the agency. But first, let me tell you about Inceptus, uh, just a high-level summary. I don't have time for a lot of raw data today, but it was, uh, it's meeting the objectives that we hoped for. And here's a high-level snapshot that we started sharing last week. So 18 boys enrolled, uh, ages 8 months to 4 years of age. And on the safety side first, no surprise, it's a terrible disease. Uh, high frequency of adverse events, serious adverse events, and sadly, one patient died, uh, which is heart-wrenching, uh, but something we feared could happen in a disease like this where 50% of the boys don't live past 24 months of age. So uh, safety was as expected. Um, on the motor uh, neuron fu motor function testing, there's two primary tests we're using, the CHOP Intend, which is particularly validated in these diseases for very young kids, up to six months, and the MFM20, which is used, uh, validated for kids two to seven years of age. Uh, I could say, tell you that the kids are well below normal, no surprise, in both tests. Uh, so it's proven to be as valuable as we hoped, showing where they are at baseline, and we have months and months of, of data in each patient now that'll serve as a nice baseline when we start looking at data from Aspiro. We're also looking at respiratory compromise. It's the primary source of morbidity and mortality in the disease. And of the 18 boys enrolled, 13 are on 24-hour-a-day full-time invasive ventilation. Uh, five are on BiPAP between 8 and 16 hours a day, which is presumably when they're sleeping. But they're all severely impaired. Uh, we did a first set of testing starting with what we call respiratory sprinting, uh, which is sort of a misnomer, but essentially it means you turn off the vent and see how long they can do. Uh, they can go without it. And that's in the invasively vented uh, kids. And not surprisingly, most of them couldn't last more than 10 minutes. But that's educational, and that's going to be a test we continue to do in Aspiro, and hopefully those, those times tick up and we get more confidence being able to relieve them of the mechanical ventilatory support they require. We're also doing MIP called Maximum Inspiratory Pressure, which is a test where you can uh, test to see how well they can take in a breath. Uh, it's a challenging test for the kids, but it'll provide additional support in the end, hopefully uh, an area where we can provide extremely high medical benefit uh, to the children. So what's a Spiro look like? Uh, it's a uh, study with three dose cohorts of four. 
uh, three different uh, low, medium, and high dose, although importantly we're starting at a dose we believe will be efficacious, which was critical to us from an ethical standpoint given uncertainty about how you might re-administer a product like this. Uh, so the first dose is 1E14, 1 times 10 to the 14th vector genomes per kilo. We'll go up to 3 and up to 5. Each cohort is designed to enroll one patient gets treated. We wait a month. If he's done okay, we'll enroll the next three in a randomized manner. Two get drug. One will be a delayed treatment control. And uh, in the end, we'll treat the and we'll do the same thing in each cohort. The control patients will get drug after six months of data from the third cohort when we've chosen what we believe is the optimal dose, which we'll do based on a combination of clinical data and muscle biopsies. So you see the measurements we'll do, the different neuromuscular tests, respiratory. The biopsies are going to be really interesting. Uh, there's a very uh, specific histopathology to the disease, and in the animals you see it normalize in the mouse, you see it normalize in the dog, hopefully we'll see it normalize in kids, and be very supportive. So and you can see the schedule of events. Our upcoming data will undoubtedly be early data from the first cohort, but we feel it's valuable to, set, to uh, share that with the community. And then, of course, over the 2018, we'll have more data to come. And then briefly, I'll talk about uh, Kriegler-Najjar. Kriegler is a severe liver disease. Uh, scientifically, it has many of the same hallmarks of MTM that we just talked about. Uh, interestingly, again, uh, the liver is otherwise very healthy. So the tissue we're targeting, we think, can recover. Uh, the protein we're replacing is an enzyme that we believe you need maybe at 5 to 10 percent of normal levels to have a therapeutic effect. Uh, it's an extremely rare disease. It's a terrible disease in that it's a disease where you're missing this enzyme that breaks down, uh, helps break down bilirubin into a form that can be metabolized. And as a result, you have elevated bilirubin that gets into the blood, can get in the brain and be neurotoxic and cause early death. The available therapy is phototherapy. Uh, kids must uh, lay under the photo, the, the light uh, 12 to 20 hours a day for a lifetime. Uh, so it's a terrible disease. That's the, that's the hand of an actual child with the disease, which was stunning to me. Uh, so again, we're using AV8, uh, going after the liver. In this case, we have the benefit of a very clear and robust biomarker with serum bilirubin levels. We're taking a similar approach now. It's not as complex a disorder. Uh, bilirubin is your key measure for efficacy and, of course, their time on phototherapy. We're characterizing that first in Lustro, so another natural history and run-in study, just like we are doing in MTM. In this case, though, you don't maybe need as much data for as long to be able to understand the condition of the patients at baseline. They'll roll over from Lustro into Valens, which is our treatment study, which will commence very shortly. And, uh, and Valens has uh, the similar outlook to, or similar design to the MTM uh, Aspiro study. The only difference is that uh, the doses are lower, of course, because we're targeting the liver. And uh, in this case, the patients are only alive at baseline because they're on phototherapy. But interestingly, uh, the neurotoxic level in a patient for bilirubin level is about 20 uh, milligrams per deciliter. Phototherapy brings patients down on average to the teens. But normal, hopefully what everyone in this room is at, is almost undetectable, one. So there's plenty of room for improvement, even when they're on phototherapy. So the design is we give treatment. We hopefully see bilirubin levels come down to normal levels. We monitor that to make sure that that remains the case for 12 weeks. And if it does, we then wean them off of phototherapy and continue to monitor. And, and hopefully, in the end, have a data set that's obviously very compelling for real-life application for these patients and families. So uh, that's the design of Kriegler. Again, we expect to have preliminary data by uh, year end and into uh, over the course of 2018. And that is the summary. Uh, we're, we're thrilled with the progress we've made in the company we've built and looking forward to really powerful milestones. And hopefully next year I'll be standing here telling you about uh, kids with two diseases clearly improving. So thank you very much for your attention.